hits the shovel, ricochets back towards number three, and that's when the roof caved in, igniting the thermos of pure grain alcohol, instantly vaporizing his bodily form, leaving nothing but a charcoal statue and a high-pitched squeal. Despite what half of YouTube might have you believe, Rango was a big deal. It was a massive change of pace for a director with no experience in animation sailing off the success of a multi-billion dollar box office film trilogy. Critics loved it, audiences respected it, no I'm not making the joke. Had box office numbers good enough to convince Paramount Pictures to start an animation company? And to this day is still one of the few non-Disney Pixar movies to win an Oscar for Best Animated Feature Film. And yet, after about a year, the conversation around it died. This is just what happens to all but the most franchisable of movies, and with the rise of social media's algorithm fuel blink and you miss a trend soon after Rango's release, that window of discussion has only gotten shorter. But I can't let this go. I am baffled that a movie that went so far out of its way to give the industry and audiences alike a new way to see animation is now just another 2000s-ish fever dream. And it's why, in this video, I want to talk about why I think it deserves so much better as I explore the weird world of life. For those who don't know, Rango is a 2011 animated western directed by Gore Verbinski and produced by uh, these companies about an eccentric pet chameleon stranded in the Mojave Desert who gets dragged into the drama surrounding the drought-stricken, crime-ridden, and corrupt politicking town the time forgot known as Dirt, where water is money and a shortage of it has left its desert animal-based inhabitants struggling to stay afloat. As after creating a tough-as-nails cowboy persona called you know. He's made sheriff of the town and left to figure out the conspiracy surrounding this sudden drought. But how does he control the water? Well, you, you gotta spend some time and train them. Cause you know, funkies, when they do go, you rub their nose in it. It's an hour and 40 minutes of good old fashioned rootin', tootin', guns at dawn shootin', action and offbeat comedy that has a lot of fun playing around with the quirks of its small town cast and genre cliches. And my god was it hard to find. I don't mean to veer off into a tangent this soon, but Christ. I checked Netflix. Nope. I checked Disney Plus. Nope. I checked Prime Video. Not in my region. Hulu and HBO are not a thing in Ireland. Daily Motion? Not this time. I checked Golden Discs. Nothing. I went all the way to the fucking Tower Record in the middle of Dublin where they had Rambo and both Django's and The Last Tango and every alphabetical combination except the one I was looking for! Fuck! It was only at this moment that I stopped to think, I wonder if it's on Amazon. And sure enough, there it was for like eight bucks. I wasted so much time. My poor decision making skills aside, I did manage to get my hands on it. And one of the first things I noticed is that part one, this movie is ugly. I mean, look at this and this and this and... Oh. Does this make me a furry if I said smash? It's also grungy and grimy and sweaty, and I love it. There's texture in every little detail, from the nicks and scratches along the edges of its smoothest surfaces, to the way its designs skew everyone's proportions to hammer home an offbeat personality to its world that embraces its imperfections. A big part of Rango's style comes from the fact that it was made more like a live-action film than an animated one. The first recording for the film wasn't done in a booth, but on a sound stage, as the cast acted out every single scene in a 20-day recording session that let the director work in a way he was more comfortable with, gave the animators plenty of reference footage to draw on for the animation, and as Kevin Martell, the film's associate animation supervisor, points out, let them explore ideas more quickly than if they'd had to wait weeks to animate a scene before seeing if it works. As Verbinski explains, I guess the idea behind it is that none of us have done this before, and when people said, this is the way you make animated movies, we were kind of like, that's not the way we make a regular movie. So why would we abandon techniques we use in live action or a visual effects picture? So much of it is rooted in that live action experience, from the way they lit a scene, to making the lens feel worn and weathered, to the way a digital camera was set up for Verbinski to explore Dirt's environment and make changes based on how things looked in camera. Hell, even the studio that animated it, Industrial Lights and Magic, isn't your usual animation house. It's a VFX company focused on special effects for live action movies that Verbinski had relied on for the Pirates trilogy, and to this day, Rango is still one of the only fully animated films they've made. It built 
rebuilt its look and feel from the ground up on the kind of gritty and awkward details you'd see in live action. And that style still stands out to me. Franco released the same year as The Adventures of Tintin, Nomeo and Juliet, Rio, A Monster in Paris, Mars Needs Moms, and Arthur Christmas. And it came after a decade defined for me by things like Kung Fu Panda, Cars, Happy Feet, Ice Age, and Shrek. Where everything seemed to bolt over the hedge meet Robinson's Monster vs. Aliens, Monster House, oh, why are there so many? Shark Tale, Dinosaur, Polar Express, B-Movie, A Christmas Carol, Open Season 9, Oh God, Barnyard, Anti Ampoli, Hoodwink, Hoodwink 2, Planet 51, Alpha and Omega, Eagle. Ow. Is there a pattern here? Well, considering how much of it is either straight up uncanny or full-blown furry, I'm honestly scared to even try to find one. But something that always stuck out to me is how perfect so many of them try to be, with clean and crisp cartoony designs, or not quite there yet realism. While Rango does everything it can to show off its flaws in a way that complements its western-inspired world and the fish-out-of-water story it focuses on. To me, it's an early example of an animated film bucking the trends of what CGI animation is expected to be by building its visual style in service of its story. And it's interesting to look back on as the variety of CG styles expands, with some of the biggest hits of recent years being animations that look like comic books, scrapbooks, or paintings. And especially when you look at the difference between some of the things that came out the same year as Rango, in 2011, and their sequels over a decade later in 2022. And that focus on how its story influences its style is fitting, considering how much Rango as a movie and a character is part two. Obsessed with narrative. The stage is waiting. The audience thirsts for adventure. This day we just got a little more interesting. This plot's highly predictable. Quiet! This is my favorite part. Victor, you were wooden! I said it. I mean, fuck's sake, the mythical spirited west everyone talks about is just Clint Eastwood riding a golf cart full of trophies. Rango was very aware of its meta narrative, and it revels in it. You need a little help of you. I think. Part of it comes from how open its creators have been about their inspirations, from the mysticism of Hayao Miyazaki's filmography to the very long list of films its director grew up on, like Once Upon a Time in the West, Being There, Chinatown, and even Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. There's A Fistful of Dollars, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Cat Bayou, Tuck Your Sucker, Once Upon a Time in America, Oh God, Not Again, Charlie, The Passenger Pursued, Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, The Searchers, The Wild Bunch, El Tapo, The Shaky Gun, and There's a tangible reverence for film as a medium and westerns as a genre throughout Rango. And part of it comes from Rango himself. He's someone who loves theatre and performing, because as a pet chameleon his only experience with the outside world would probably be whatever his owners left playing on TV, his own personal stage to watch. So when he gets knocked out of his very isolated bubble, he's only able to understand this world through those tropes and cliches. And since he's the main character, it's through that perspective the audience also experiences everything. And I feel like it's to its detriment at times. As interesting as this world and its characters are, and as much depth to their history as it implies, they're also exactly what I'd expect from this story. And it doesn't really spend a lot of time fleshing them out beyond the one-note archetypes it establishes them as. The only characters I think feel truly distinct are Rango, Beans, the toughest nails desert iguana trying to prove something fishy's going on with the water, and Rattlesnake Jake, the absolute force of nature who barrels through the end of the film. Sure, he's a two-dimensional villain who loves to be evil, but the film spends so much time building him up, hinting at his history and rivalries and the danger he presents. And when he finally arrives, he more than pays off all that setup. Now hold on, Chief. There's no need Let me do my job! You brought me in there, we're gonna play this thing out to the end. Sign the damn paper, woman! Go to hell! Where do you think I could? Even as someone who loves this film, I have to admit its reliance on stock characters and ideas makes it less memorable to me than other films from the time. More than anything, Rango's self-awareness feels like its own way of figuring out where it stands amongst its peers and icons, and while it leads to a lot of great moments, I also feel that worry about its position in the cinematic landscape can weigh it down more than it helps. But I do get it, because its status was always going to be questioned, for one very simple reason that I'll explain after this this break! Part 3. Everybody Hates Animation. Characters hold such a special place in 
our hearts because animated films make up some of our most formative movie experiences as kids. So many kids watch these movies over and over and over and over and over and over and over. I see some parents out there know exactly what we're talking about. This isn't new for the Oscars. It's the same place whose voters at best often base their choice for best animated feature on what their kids think, and at worst, call those nominees. Some obscure frickin' Chinese fucking things nobody ever frickin' saw. Referring to the 2014 nominees from Japan and Ireland. But this year's dismissal feels like even more of a slap in the face. Cause it came after animation held up the film industry throughout the pandemic in the middle of the New Deal for Animation campaign, fighting for better working conditions in the industry, and shortly before Netflix axed most of its animated projects and a big chunk of its animation staff. Except, of course, for the Boss Baby Show! <laughs> Admittedly, it's been hard for me to figure out where exactly the stigma against animation originally came from. Maybe the rise of TV animation and its heavier reliance on limited animation to create content that was much longer and more frequent than the industry was used to made people think it was cheap. Maybe the deregulation of TV standards in the US under the Reagan administration leading to more of those shows becoming marketing vehicles to sell merch to impressionable audiences made people dismiss animation as just a bunch of glorified toy commercials. Maybe Maybe the overwhelming success of Disney and Pixar's family-friendly brand left a lot of mainstream audiences thinking that animation can only be family-friendly. Maybe it's a little bit of everything and more that I don't even know about. And despite how many examples there are to show how fast and diverse animation can be as a medium, those initial impressions always stick. Hell, at a roundtable discussion with different animation directors in 2011 that included the likes of Chris Miller, Jennifer Yu Nelson, and John Lasseter, man, haven't heard about him in a while. I wonder what he's up to. Oh. Oh god. When Verbinski talked about his interest in adult animation, they seemed shocked. There's a price tag with that just in terms of achieving that quality level. What happened to the Ralph Bakshis of the world? We're all sitting here talking about family entertainment. Does animation have to be family entertainment? I think at that cost, yes. There's a bullseye you have to hit, but when you miss it by a little bit and you do something interesting, the bullseye is going to move. Audiences want something new, they just can't articulate what. The business model for family entertainment is sated and very content. And there is a lot of really brilliant family entertainment, but I'd like to see animation that's more niche. You can also do that within the market for family entertainment. But could it be PG-13? Could it be R? Why? Why do you have to do that? You don't have to, I'm just saying. Could it be? Well, it's a filmmaker-driven art form. At Pixar and Disney, we have filmmakers that love to push the edge of the boundary, but still make it okay for the kids to see. What I'm saying is we could make animation that's not for the kids to see too. I don't think you want to say, hey, bring your family to this movie that's inappropriate. But animation can be so much more if we let those boundaries loose. PG-13 can be action adventure. You could make a PG-13 version of Treasure Island. I think there's room. Which I think bit Rango in the ass, cause it doesn't feel like a movie made for kids. There's so many references to guns and violence and sex and innuendos and abuse and neglect and drinking and alcoholism and I had so many characters smoke that there was a campaign to make it rated R. And thematically it touches on things like abuse of authority, corporate exploitation, evangelical manipulation, something about Las Vegas and water shortages being a metaphor for like capitalism or whatever that I'm too stupid to explain. Not the way a series like Avatar The Last Airbender shows these issues to younger audiences in a way they can understand without sacrificing their weight, but in a way that expects you to already know that I think it'd go over most kids' heads. I certainly didn't notice, though. Maybe that says more about me. It's not that I think kids can't or even shouldn't watch it, but I don't think they were the audience its creators had in mind. And yet, so much of the conversation around it specifically centered around that younger audience. A lot of its negative reviews talk about how inappropriate or vulgar it is, how boring it'll be for kids. And that smoking controversy rants about the effect seeing someone smoke would have on children. And I mean, I guess it's kind of fair considering that it was funded by Nickelodeon, a very famously kid-oriented media channel, but still. Being an animated movie gave Rango a lot of hurdles I don't think it was quite able to get over. But I'd have to respect it for doing what it wanted to do in spite of all that pressure. Cause... Part 4. No man can walk out on his own story. According to its creators, Rango is an identity quest. A story about a character figuring out who they are. 
and Rango's is pretty easy to follow. A lonely man, desperate for praise, gets thrown out of his comfort zone, lies through his teeth about who he is to survive, and when the truth is revealed, he loses all hope. Until a wise old mentor gives him a revelation. These days, I got a name for just about everything. Doesn't matter what they call you. It's the deeds make the man. It's a simple message, but it's helped me through both times of my life Rango's cropped up in. When I first saw it, I was 13 and about to go from being a pudgy little baby boy in primary school who was worried about getting absolutely clattered by my teachers, to being a pudgy little baby man in secondary school who did the healthy teenager thing of bottling up my feelings and letting them fester while listening to Imagine Dragons alone in my room. Man, secondary sucked. Now, at the age of 24, I'm re-watching it after what have been the darkest years of my life, as I'm getting my shit together. Back then, Rango's message was advice for a version of me that was scared of everything and everyone, and who did and said anything to feel safe, even if it fucked them in the long run. But now, Rango's message is a reminder to a version of me that's trying to do better, trying to be more comfortable in his own skin, and trying to be kinder to himself and everyone around him. It might be a simple message, but it still resonates. And I think part of why it does is because of how much of that journey is wrapped up in an obsession with media. I too am a weird introverted loner who loves art, and had very few people to open up to growing up. And for a long time, I was practically raised by TV. And while I do believe there is a lot of value in the way media can help us learn about ourselves and the world around us, what I didn't get for a long time is that these shows wrap everything up in a neat little triac bow and give everyone and everything to find parts to play, and that's just not how reality works. Sure, some stories get pretty damn close, but life is so much more messy and brutal and there's no guarantee anything you do will amount to anything. And for a kid like me riddled with anxiety, it felt a lot easier, a lot safer to just get lost in those stories and not bother with the real world. But it also meant I spent a long time never finding out if anything I did could amount to something. And at a certain point, I couldn't keep living like that. I had to go out and touch some... Sand, I think, is the fitting metaphor here. The point isn't just to tell nerds to go outside. Mostly. But I'm not the only person who's gotten lost in that escapism, and I know what it can do to a person when they've been stuck in it for long enough. And more importantly, the rabbit holes it can drag someone down if they're not careful. And while I'd like to give some advice to avoid it, I don't think individual action will ever be enough to completely fix it. There are so many societal issues that push people down these paths. Like the abysmal state of mental health care in many countries, including my own, to the kind of corporate greed that actively preys on those institutions securities to make a profit. But if there's anything I could say to someone in that position, it's that, in my experience, the only way out is to stop treating that escapism as an end goal and use it as a starting point to figure your shit out before it's too late. After all, you've got your own story to live, and nobody can walk out on their own story. In conclusion, what can be learned from Rango? I think the main thing for me is just how quickly things can be forgotten, even when they feel like the kind of thing that people would still be obsessed with. But honestly, I don't think Rango needs to be. It might not be the talk of the town anymore, but it did what it wanted to do, said what it needed to say, and rode off into the sunset. Sure, I'd love for more people to rant and rave about it, but I'm also very aware of how easily it could have outstayed its welcome. And for the people who do remember it, it's not the kind of thing they're going to forget anytime soon. And yeah, those are my thoughts. Sorry if my voice sounds off, hay fever's just been absolutely destroying me lately. There's a reason I don't like summer. And man, this was a difficult video to figure out. I do want my videos to feel snappy and chaotic, but at the same time, especially for these world of videos, I think they can feel like they're constantly meandering. I don't want to fix that without completely losing that rambling tangent vibe by giving it a proper through line. But I'm not quite sure I managed to get it right really hard to find that balance, you know? It also meant cutting the other stuff I could talk about section, but honestly, I don't think I had much to say there anyway, other than maybe talking about where the cast and crew are nowadays. But I feel like I would have had to talk about the Johnny Depp Amber Heard situation and like, it's already enough of a shit show as it is. And I don't want to add to the weird social media meme content circus everyone's fucking turned it into. I also experimented with some editing stuff by scrapping the bordered video look. It's a nice aesthetic and I'm not completely getting rid of it, but it's a lot of extra work I 
don't think is really worth it, especially because I feel like it can hurt the watching experience because it almost creates an expectation that something's gonna happen but there isn't, and it almost feels tiring to constantly watch. So I decided to keep the green border stuff specifically for the parts where I'm actually doing something with the editing. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but still, let me know how you feel about that. Anyway, hope you're staying safe, washing your hands, wearing a mask, keeping your distance, getting vaccinated if you can, and let me know what you think. If you agree, disagree, why your favorite design from Rango is, if there's any other bizarre, fever dream-esque animated movies from your childhood you feel like you're the only person who remembers, etc. And thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this and want see more, then check out my last video, where I talk about Avatar The Last Airbender and what I think makes it work all these years later. Or watch me ramble about my top things of fall 2021. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe to come fly with me. Hit the bell, stay notified, follow me on Twitter for more updates, ramblings, poor attempts at humor, follow me on Instagram for semi-regular art stuff, and hopefully, I'll see you later.